Okay. Old Testament historical books. I think that's this class, isn't it? I, I, I prepare like all three classes at once, and this morning I actually caught myself. I was copying tomorrow's Pauline letters class onto the, the drive to bring, and I went, wait a minute, that's not to this class. This is our outline for the class. Last week, if you missed it, it is available uh, via video. Last week we did an introduction to the Old Testament historical books and talked then in the second half about the book of Joshua, the conquest of the Promised Land, and the division of the Promised Land amongst the tribes of Israel. Today we're going to talk about Judges and Ruth, the time of great moral crisis in the history of the Israelites. Next week, 1st and 2nd Samuel, the creation of the monarchy in the United Kingdom, and then David, the great king in 2nd Samuel. Uh, then we're going to spend week 4 is 1st Kings, Solomon and the divided kingdom, and week 5, 2nd Kings, division and destruction. I split kings up because we get into issues of the other international powers, Assyria and Babylon, etc., and so I'll bring some other things into those. Uh, week 6, we will deal with 1st and 2nd Chronicles, the sacred his history retold. Chronicles pulls stories from all of the previous history books um, and sort of retells it. Then Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther we will deal with in week 7. They are all about the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian exile, the temple and the city. And then Esther is a story that occurs during that time, during the, the dominance of the Persian Empire. And then the second half will be the final exam. Again, I encourage you to take the final exam. Uh, two weeks before the final, I will give you the document that tells you everything you need to know. So you can look forward to that. But at the same time, you don't have to wait until then to start studying stuff because everything that I'm going to do, uh, that I'm going to put on the, the document for all you need to know and everything that's going to be on the final exam is in the materials that's online. So if you are familiar with this stuff and you've studied that, then you'll have everything you need. Okay, You don't have to wait for week five to get, get all that. So today we're going to talk about Judges and Ruth. Let's look at the overall chart. I like this structure of the Old Testament because it breaks it down in chunks so that you can kind of visualize it. Um, the first five books of the Old Testament, of course, the Torah or the Law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We This class is dealing with the uh, history books, the 12 books that we call the books of history. Now this is the English or Gentile version of the Old Testament in terms of order. Um, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, has all of the same materials, but they order it differently. For instance, um, you know, we have the books of wisdom, five books of wisdom in the English Bible, then the five major prophets and the twelve minor prophets. In the Hebrew Bible, these twelve minor prophets are all one book. They're called the Book of the Twelve. You, get, you don't have 1st and 2nd Samuel, there's the book of Samuel. You don't have 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, there the book of Kings, the book of Chronicles. Um, and Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. So you end up with all the same material, but it's both divided differently and it's organized differently. It's not in the same order. I'm going to talk about that when I get to the book of Ruth, because while we call all of these in the English Bible the history books of the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, breaks them up differently. Uh, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings are called the former prophets. Recognizing that prophecy means speaking the word of God. And these history books are about how God fulfilled his promised covenant, that he fulfilled his word, if you will, through historical events. And so they consider them the formal, former prophets. They call what we call the major prophets, they call the latter prophets. Only Daniel's not in there. Daniel gets put somewhere else. Okay? So they break it up differently. Ruth is not included in the history books or the former prophets. And I'll explain that to you when we get to the book of Ruth. It's called one of the five scrolls, the Megillot. Okay? We'll talk about that. But we are here. Last week, Joshua. This week, Judges and Ruth. Because Judges and Ruth occur during the same time period, even though they're very, very different in how they present themselves. Uh, Judges reads like a history. Ruth is a is a wonderful short story. It's a, it's a beautiful little piece of literature that's a love story. More so a love story between a woman and her daughter-in-law than it is between a woman and a man. But there is a woman and a man love story in there as well. Okay? So this is how we picture the books of the Old Testament. Again, we see 39 books in the Old Testament. The, uh, the Jewish Tanakh counts fewer than that because they combine a bunch of them. Um, 
Then, of course, 27 books in the New Testament for a total of 66 books in the English Bible. This is where we left off last week. The end of the book of Joshua, they had conquered the land of Canaan. First, that's the first half of the book. And the second half of the book was the dividing of the land. God had promised, this is why it's called the promised land, God had promised that the Israelites would be given a land of their own, a home of their own, in terms of property, territory. This was part of the promise to Abraham. God said to Abraham, if you will follow me, if you'll be my God, um, I will do three things. I will make you a great people, and here he was talking to a relatively old man at that point, he was quite old but before he had a son, and told him he was going to make a whole giant tribe out of him. Secondly, I will give you a promised land for your people to live in. And thirdly, I will bless all the peoples of the earth through you. So this was the promised land because it was seen as the fulfillment of God's promise to give a homeland to the Jewish people, the Israelites, the descendants of Jacob, who was renamed Israel. That's why they're called the Israelites. Jacob had 12 sons. And so we have 12 allotments for the 12 tribes. Now it's a little confusing because one of the 12 sons of Jacob was Joseph. Joseph became more important in Genesis, more important in the history than any of the other sons because he's the one that got sold off into slavery and then became sort of the, the chief operating officer of all the nation of Egypt. And when the Israelites had to go there for, because of a famine, he took care of them. Because of him having saved his people, he got two shares. His two sons, Manasseh, which you'll see there's a you know there's the two halves of Manasseh on the east and west side of the river. Uh, Manasseh and Ephraim were the two sons of, of Joseph. So each of them got a share. So Joseph's part got two shares. But the Levites didn't get a share of land because they were the priests and they were supposed to take care of the temple. They were given cities to live in, but they were not given a share of the land. So it ended up being 12. 12 minus the Levites, but two for Joseph. So you're back to 12. Make sense? And this is the dividing of the land. Now, question. Yes. Uh, did God promise them more land originally than what they finally occupied? In yes, the land? they did. Quite a bit more? Actually, God promised that their land would, come, would go from considerably for, further north of this all the way down to the Sinai and from the uh, Euphrates River, which will be right over here somewhere, Sorry. to the Mediterranean. So they did not ever claim all of the land that was part of the original promise because God had laid out he, by, by markers the land he wanted them to take over. And that brings us to where we are today. You will notice here that you've still got the Philistines here. Um, you also have, um, well, what else is shown on this map? Uh, I should have looked at it more closely. You've still got... Um, the Hittites up here, Arameans, Ammonites, you know, they're surrounded by different peoples. But the problem that we run into in the book of uh, Judges is that even though Joshua, right before his death, at the end of the book of Joshua, tells the tribes, we're not done yet. We have conquered the land as a whole, but there still are very strong pockets of Canaanite peoples, and each of you that have been assigned a property, you have the responsibility to finish conquering the land, to finish claiming what God has promised for us. You know, as is always the case, you know, God will promise us things, but He expects us to do our part too. All right, the Israelites were supposed to uh, take over this land, and as necess if necessary, well, in almost every case, by military conquest. But they reached a place where several things started happening in the book of Judges. They decided they were going to sit down and have a beer and watch TV for a while and not complete the job they were given to do. And in the process, because all of those other pagan peoples continued to live in the land in various pockets, and many of the gods that the Canaanites worshipped were fertility gods which involved temple prostitution and various other things that men especially tended, to, tended toward, then they started following the habits of the Canaanites, which were clearly against the law of God, and that included worshiping the gods of the Canaanites. Worshiping the gods of the Canaanites would have involved child sacrifice and a lot of other things that were clearly abominations to God. 
So the reason why Judges and Ruth, because it's during the same period of time, I listed under a moral crisis, is the Israelites really fall on their face. Not in a good way before God. They, they fail both to fulfill the task they've been given in, the, in the, the land of Canaan, in the promised land. They also fail in terms of their obedience to God. And this whole book is about that process. Now, and I'll get into why it's the book of Judges in just a second. This is the land of Canaan. I showed you this map last week. The seven nations of Canaan were the ones that they continued to have some problems with. Okay? Out here you've got the Edomites. This was the land of Edom. The Moabites, Ammonites, the uh, land of Bashan, the Arameans, um, the Sidonians. But the ones that they really were having trouble with, both during the early conquest and then later on, they had Perizzites, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Can Canaanites, which is sort of a, Je it's a conglomerate, different tribes that were living together. And uh, some of the judges were dealing with sort of unified forces from different uh, Canaanite tribes. The Girgasites and the Hylites, okay? All of these were different people. They had different gods, which were still all related. Like they would each have their own god, but they thought they were all connected to each other. They were all really descended from the Sumerian gods, the gods of Mesopotamia, which is up in here, the land between the rivers. Um, yes? Can you point out what is today, Israel today? Um, yeah, it comes down, this is the Gaza Strip. It comes down here, comes back up this way, uh, not quite as far as Tyre. So this is, well, okay, you have the West Bank too. Modern, well, yeah, the West Bank. But uh, modern Israel is pretty close to this, okay? Oh, okay. And so this is the same thing except without the colored delineations. This is the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea as they knew it, the, the River Jordan. Um, and this is the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Gennesaret. So you sort of get a perspective here. Uh, Jerusalem, right here. Now you'll notice the Jebusites. Jerusalem was controlled by the Jebusites. It was not until King David comes along that they succeed in conquering the city of Jerusalem. It was a fortified city that they did not, they decided that they didn't think they could take it, so they didn't try. Uh, there are other places where they say, well, they didn't conquer uh, a particular one of these peoples because they had iron chariots. Well, they didn't go to war with them. It's just because they had iron chariots, they were afraid to go to war with them. In other words, they did not have faith that God would give them victory, even though he promised to. The same reason they wandered around the desert for 40 years before they were allowed to enter the promised land, because they didn't believe that God was going to keep his word when he promised to give them victory. And so in various other ways, they simply did not proceed to fulfill the obligation God had given them to conquer this land. Okay? And that's what this is all about. Um, let's talk about the general overview of the book of Judges. We'll deal with Judges first and then the book of Ruth. Um, the author is unknown. It is traditionally uh, considered to be Samuel. Frequently, you'll hear a writer, even a conservative writer, say that the book is anonymous. That doesn't mean that, um, that there's nobody to attribute it to. The only thing that ever means when you're talking about a biblical book is the book itself does not say who wrote it. As opposed to like the Pauline letters, where he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, you know, to the church in Corinth or whatever. Um, there is no internal reference to who wrote it in, in many of these books. Now, there are references in Joshua to the fact that Joshua was told to write things down. But it doesn't say, this is the book of Joshua in it. Okay? So it is anonymous. It is traditionally considered to have been written by Samuel. Now, time period, we believe the events occurred between 1380 and 1045 BC. Now, you will notice... 1380 as the date of the entrance into the Promised Land, and after the initial battles, and then the time of Judges. There are two schools of thought. One of them would say that the Exodus and the entry into the Promised Land was 200 years later. Uh, the traditional date for the Exodus is about 1445, so the time, you know, 40 years in the desert, they were about 1380 to 1400 is about the time they were getting ready and crossing over into the Promised Land. And then Joshua led them for a period of about 20 years or so to conquer most of the land. So that's what puts Judges about 1380. And I hold to those older dates because there are at least three different places in the Old Testament where there are date references, reference, like in 1 Kings, which tell us 
when the Exodus occurred in, in comparison to when the temple was started by Solomon. And we know when that date was because of other kings and things. And so if you, if you work through those dates, there's more evidence for an earlier dating, that is 1400-ish, for the time in the desert than for a later date, which would be the 12, 1200s. So I hold to the, the Exodus happening about 1440, 1445, the time in the desert being up until about 1400, the time of the judges, once they got in the land and conquered most of it, as being about 1380. Now, you'll, you see 1380 to 1045. This was the, the period when this is being covered. Um, we're given dates for, or periods of time rather, for each of the judges, because they will say, for instance, um, the, the people of Israel were uh, oppressed by the Moabites for 18 years, and then a judge came forward as the, as, the, as the military leader and freed them from that oppression, and then they had peace for 80 years. Then they'll have another major judge, and they'll do the same thing. Well, if you add all those up, it's too many years. Because we believe that, all, that uh, several of the judges were involved at the same time. Now, let me tell you what a judge is. A judge does not mean he's got a black robe and a gavel and he sits up there. Um, the judges were heroes that were called up by God and anointed. They did probably, and in at least one case we have an example of that, Deborah, where she actually did adjudicate from legal disputes. But for the most part what they did was they provided leadership, including military leadership, in order to... Um, to fight against some of the, the Canaanite peoples or the Moabites or others that were oppressing the Israelites. Defeat them and then give them a period of, of peace. Now, the reason for this is because there's a cycle that keeps recurring throughout Judges. And that is the people of Israel and various tribes. You know, there, there are 12 Judges and they're all over the place. In fact, let me show you that map. All of these brown things are judges. There are six major judges, we call them that simply because we're told more about their story, and six minor judges. We'll get into an outline and I'll show you that. But Shamgar, Elon, Deborah, whom you've probably heard of, Jair, Gideon you've probably heard of, Jephthah you might have heard of, Tola, Abdon, Ehud, Ibzan, Samson, very famous, Othniel are the 12 judges. Now you've heard of all of these because you've already read this, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. As long as your assignment for this week. You'll notice that they're spread out all over. Because different judges came from different tribes, and they had different opponents that were causing problems for the Israelites. But in every case, the story is the same. The particular Israelites of that tribe, whichever one it was at the time, turned away from God. They failed to fulfill the obligation they had to finish taking the land. And then they started worshiping foreign gods, especially, you will read, the Baals, or Baals, sometimes pronounced, B-A-A-L-S. The word Baal means Lord, or Master, sometimes Husband. It's a generic word, and it means any of the gods, the Canaanite gods, that they worshiped in particular places, because in different places they worship different ones. The story of Samson, as you just read, they end up taking Samson down to the temple of Dagon, who was the primary deity worshipped by the Philistines. There are others, Haman Baal and others in different places. Baal simply means, it's a generic word which means the particular pagan god that they worshipped in this area, that the Canaanites worshipped in this area. You've, the names were uh, Moloch and Chemosh and uh, various other names. And I could, I could give you a genealogy of where these gods were supposed to have come from. Most of them were first generation after the, the elder gods of the Sumerians. Okay? But all of these were pagan gods. Almost all of them were fertility gods. They talk about the Baals and the Asherah. You know the Asherah poles? Asherah was considered to be the consort, the female partner of the local Baal, okay? The, it, it was a fertility god. The reason there were Asherah poles was that's a phallic symbol. And it has to do with fertility. We don't even know exactly what they were. There are a lot of different artists' conceptions of what those would have been. They may have been trees that were stripped of all their leaves and branches. They may have been like totem poles. They may have been any number of things. But they were fertility symbols because both the Baals and the Asherahs, their, their consort, their female counterpart, were fertility gods. 
And whenever you get into fertility god worship, you get into prostitution and you know all kinds of other things. And the idea of sacri human sacrifice in order to appease the gods so that the next harvest would be good. Or so that the people would have more children overall if you sacrifice a child to the god or whatever. Fertility gods always get in trouble. More so than other kind of false deities. And that was the case. So the Israelites would, they did not do what God told them to do. They, they let the Canaanites stay in the land and then they started cozying up to these Canaanites. Following their traditions. Marrying into their families. Following their religious practices. As awful as they were. Well, in punishment for that, God would send oppressors. The Ammonites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Moabites, various ones at different times to different areas within the Promised Land. The people under the oppression of these particular pagan, pagan peoples would cry out to God and say, God, help us! And God, in His mercy, even though they had not deserved it, and they would, they would repent. They would say, God, we're really sorry. You know, we turn back to you. Help us. God would raise up a judge who was a political leader, a military leader, a hero, to provide leadership to defeat the enemy, and then to provide continuing leadership after that for some period of time. It varies from a year to 80 years from the various judges. Now, we hear, though, with six of these judges, we'll look at specifically, are the major judges. Six of them are minor judges. The minor judges we don't hear any details about. One of them, uh, which is the one in the north, Shamgar, we have one verse that mentions that he was a judge, and he goes on to something else. Okay, but back to this. So, a failure to complete the conquest, the judgment of God occurs by allowing these Canaanite tribes to oppress the Israelites. Then, when they repent and appeal to God for help, God sends deliverance. And the same story happens over and over again. That's why we have multiple judges in different places. Uh, for, we have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar are, uh, and Shamgar, by the way, says southern. Some, some places have Shamgar up here, some have him down here. Because it's only one verse, we're not really sure where he was. And so we think he's either in the far north or the far south. Yeah. Um, this map has him in the north. Oops, sorry. Um, this outline, we talk about him being southern. Deborah and Barak, northern, not quite as far north. Gideon, Abimelech, Tola, and Jair, central. Abimelech was not actually a judge. He was a false king, the son of Gideon. Okay. Uh, Jephthah in the eastern section, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon in the second area of the northern part, and Samson in the west, the Philistines along the coast. So all of these different areas, the various tribes of Israel in those areas rebelled against God, did not, uh, were not obedient, they followed foreign gods, they fell in with the Canaanites, the Canaanites oppressed them, they call out to God, God sends a leader to protect them. Okay? And then, we've got, so you've got kind of an introduction, what the problem is, how God was judging them, and then all of the different stories make up the body of Judges, from chapter uh, 3 to chapter 16, and then chapter 17 to 21, are two distinct stories which demonstrate nothing about a specific judge, but just illustrate the depravity that Israel had fallen to. First, the religious depravity, and then the moral and political depravity. Did, did you guys read those stories? Mm -hmm. Yes. What did you think yes. about? Oh. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> that's that's, just that's a good reaction. They're horrific. <laughs> They're horrible. Okay. Um, and, right. and Samson being smitten by a Philistine yeah. woman, and he should know better, kind of thing. Well, yeah, and that's not part of the last part, but, you know, um, not all of the judges were the most noble of char characters. <laughs> you know, Samson had his definite problems, pretty much all of them related to women, although there was a real pride issue going on there, too. Um, you do have a couple of them, um, Deborah and, for the most part, Gideon are really noble characters that you could really model yourself after, but some of the others, not so much. Okay. Yes, Joanna? I didn't get why Abimelech was in there. It well, just seems very odd. It is odd, and I think, again, one of the reasons that, that he's inserted, and he was not he's not listed as one of the judges, but his story, you know, he yeah. he's the son of Gideon, and um, Jerob uh, Baal, Jerob Baal means the, you know, the victor over Baal. Okay, that's the name that they gave to Gideon. Um, 
it's an example of the fact that they had no moral compass. You know, when, when um, Gideon dies, his own son goes and kills his 70, it's, his, it's actually his, you know, his son by a different mother, goes and kills his 70 half-brothers in order to take political power. And he takes over political power, he oppresses the people, um, creates a civil war, and then ends up, you know, the, the, the ultimate fate, um, negative fate for somebody in that time was to be killed by a woman. And so he's attacking the tower of people that, you know, that are supposed to be his part of the people of Israel, part of his people, and a woman at the top of the tower where they're hiding out throws a millstone off and it hits him in the head and kills and he's dying and he tells his, his uh, servant, kill me with your sword so that nobody can say he died by the, you know, he was killed by a woman, which is the worst of all possible things that can happen, okay? It seemed to me like dying in any way is probably. <laughs> but millstone to the head by a woman was, you know, and that's put in there. In fact, everything is put in here to demonstrate just how far the Israelites had fallen. You know, you realize this book can't, comes not only, to, it comes uh, chronologically right after the time of Joshua. The time when God was performing miraculous things like, you know, the fall of the walls of Jericho and, you know, these ex the extraordinary military campaign that is still today recognized as being, you know, an amazing feat of military conquest or whatever. All of that wonder of God's presence with the Israelites in the book of Joshua and everything in the book of Judges, including the story of Abimelech, is in there in order to say, look how far they've fallen. Because they were, first, they were not obedient. And not being obedient led them to not be, uh, to not worshiping God, worshiping other beings, and that led to oppression and all kinds of other things. So, um, we're going to sort of go through the outline and we'll talk about these two sections that show the depravity of Israel. The story of Micah and his own personal Levite priest, and the false, the, and the gods that he made, you know. And there's even parts of that story that if you don't really pay attention, you'll miss. Like the fact that it starts out with Micah having stolen 1,100 pieces of silver from his own mother. And then he, get, he gives them back to her, it says, sorry, gives them back to her, and she says, well, I'm committing all of this to God. And then she takes 200 pieces of silver and gives them to a silversmith to make an image, which is supposed to be an image of worship to God, but God said, don't make any images yeah. for me. So that's a violation of the Ten Commandments. And what did she do with the other 900 pieces of silver she said she was going to give to God? Okay, There's all kinds of pieces of stuff in there when you, when you tease it out that are really quite something. And, you know, instead of the worship to God was supposed to be done at the tabernacle, which at this point is at Shiloh, which was the, the mobile temple, so to speak. Nobody was supposed to have their own altars. In fact, the Benjamites, at the end of Joshua, the Benjamites almost had caught a civil war, um, or the, the Manasseh and uh, Ephraim, rather, because when they head back across the, the river, they set up a stone of remembrance, and they think it's an altar, and they almost have a war over it. Well, here Micah has his, creates these uh, household gods and a silver idol, which he claims is dedicated to Yahweh God, Gets this Levite to agree to be his own private priest and worship in just his house when nobody's supposed to worship anywhere other than the, than at the um, the tabernacle, and it's just awful stuff. Okay, we'll get into the rest of that later. Sorry, I just get kind of wrapped up. It gets worse. Oh, it gets worse. Yeah, it gets much worse. Concubine being cut in twelve pieces. Now, these are, I think, this, this sets the stage for you in terms of what's going on here. I call these, uh, these next two slides probably the key verses. There, there are others I could pick. It's always a problem when you select key verses. But <clears throat> Judges 2, 10 to 15. After that whole generation, that is the generation of Joshua, had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So that's partly their parents' fault. Yeah. Yes. Or maybe even mostly their parents' fault. Yeah. Then the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. You see, that's plural. Because there were a lot of different gods, fertility gods, that were worshipped by the Canaanites. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's 
because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. Again, that's the consort, the female companion to the male uh, Canaanite god. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Whoops. Keep forgetting which button I'm supposed to push. And continuing in verse 16 of the second chapter. Page. Then the Lord raised up judges. Here's, the, here's God's act of caring for them in the midst of their apostasy. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and work to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their ancestors, they quickly turned from following the way of their ancestors, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. So this is the story of, of the judges. And again, we have six major judges that we hear the very specific stories about. So let's talk about that. Um, judges begins with a prologue in which we are told of the failing, and you just heard part of it, the failing of the Israelites to complete the conquest of the land, which God had ordered them to do, and Joshua had been very specific in instructing them about before his death. In fact, Joshua gives them two options. Joshua said, if you are obedient to God and you complete the conquest of the land as you have been told, then God will bless you and you will be his people and he will be your God and it will be wonderful. But Joshua says, but if you don't, if you take the other path and you do not be obedient to God and you do not get rid of the Canaanites, then you are going to start falling into their influence and you are going to worship other gods and God will judge you for it. Joshua told them that was going to happen. And then it does. They chose the second way rather than being obedient to God. So here at the prologue, we're told in the first three verses about the fact that they first would not complete the, the conquest and then they committed apostasy. And he breaks it down into two episodes. All of these books, while we read through them and it may seem like things are kind of jumbled together, when you start studying them, there are very clear um, designs. You know, there's a structure here. For instance, the prologue has two episodes. And the final section, the last four verses, the last verses from 17 to 21, have two episodes. And then in between, you have the story of six major judges and six minor judges. There's a very clear structure that's always present in these books. Okay? And you don't always see it. Some of, sometimes you have, as we talked about in the prophets class, the book of Daniel, there's such a formal structure, it's called the chiasm, where it works its way up, and then it works its way back with, with very clearly parallel examples to the first stories. And it keeps doing it. It's like, it's, it's like this great cycle. And the structure in Hebrew writing is very, very meticulous. Sometimes it would be, well, always would be clearer to us that that was the case if we were reading it in Hebrew. But we're not. Okay. And so it's not always as clear for us to see that when we read it in English. But you have the first two episodes, and again, simply, Israel does evil in the eyes of the Lord. Those are the words that are used. The people are given into the hands of their enemies, and when they are oppressed for a period of time, they cry out to Yahweh. Yahweh raises up a leader, a judge. The spirit of Yahweh, we're told, that's the expression, comes upon the leader. The leader manages to defeat the enemy, and then peace is regained for the lifetime of that judge. And then the Israelites start doing it all over again. Because the judges not only were military leaders, but they provided direction for the, the Israelites during the time that they were alive. Um, and as you can see, Othniel is the first of the, of the judges that's mentioned. He defeats the Ar uh, Arab Naharaim, the Ara uh, Arameans, meaning they were from the area of Syria in the north. Damascus and that area that were coming down to oppress. Um, so he was the first major judge. And we have 
in chapter 3. There's not a lot of detail. We're just told who he was and what happened and how long. Now, uh, to give you an idea, I've got written out here. Um, somewhere in my notes. Othniel, they had suffered oppression for eight years. And then, after they defeated the, the Arameans, they had peace for 40 years until Othniel died. Then the next is uh, Ehud. Ehud, they were being oppressed by the Moabites. They had been oppressed for 18 years. And then after Ehud comes up and defeats the Moabites, they had peace for 80 years. Then we have one verse about Shamgar. Poor little Shamgar. <laughs> 331 is the only reference we have. We don't know anything about who it was that was oppressing them or how long it lasted or anything else. Then, one of the most famous, we have Deborah, a woman, a prophetess. And remember, the scripture says the gift of prophecy is the highest of all of the spiritual gifts. So, uh, Deborah actually calls on the captain of the, uh, of the Israelites in that area, and this was in Zebulun and Naphtali, uh, whose name was Barak, and says, okay, Barak, um, you know, I want you to go, and, and God, the Lord has told me you're to go fight these people and everything else. And Barak says, well, I'll go, but you have to go with me. And Deborah says, well, fine, I will go with you, and Israel will gain victory, but you won't get credit for it. And it ends up that the captain um, of the, the Hazor, which was a city in, the, it's a Canaanite people, but Hazor was the city they came from, the Sisera was in charge of the military of the people from Hazor, and after they defeat the army of Hazor, Sisera is running for it, and he ends up seeking refuge in the tent of a woman who is loyal to Israel. And he goes in, and, and she gives him milk to drink, and he goes in and falls asleep. You know what milk does to you, right? Tryptophan, it's like turkey, <laughs> falls asleep. So he goes to sleep, and he's lying there asleep, and she goes in with a tent peg and a, a mallet, drives a tent peg all the way through his temple, and fastens his head to the ground. <laughs> And so Barak didn't get credit for them having won the victory over Sisera and the army of Hazor. A woman did. Well, two women did. Deborah and the woman who killed Sisera. Jail. So, was that? Wasn't her name Jael? Jael, jail. yes. Jael. Jael or Jael. Jail. Yes. Um, and so Deborah is one of the most famous. She is, it's said that she would adjudicate cases and provide leadership for the people underneath uh, uh, the, the trees in an area that was named for her. So they had suffered 20 years of oppression before Deborah. After they defeated the army of Hazor and Sisera, they had 40 years of peace. Then we have uh, Gideon comes along. Gideon defeats the Midianites. Um, they had been oppressed for seven years. Again, they had 40 years of peace afterwards. He was from the half-tribe of Manasseh. And these were, uh, the Midianites are an amalgam of Arabic tribes. Uh, some Midianites, some uh, Amalekites, etc. Gideon, one of the most famous. And the wonderful stories of Gideon, who's very humble. He says, I am the least of the least of the families of my little tribe. And so he has the wonderful scene where he asks God, well, I need you to make, to just prove to me, you mean it. I, not, to be, not to be disrespectful now, but how about if I take this, you know, this fleece, which is a sheepskin, and I lay it out on the threshing floor, which is a field where they would do threshing. And if there is, if there is dew on the fleece, but not on the ground around it, then I'll know that this is truly from you. And God gives him that miracle and goes, okay, not, not to be disrespectful, but one more time. If I put the fleece out again, how about if there is dew all around it, but no dew on the fleece, then I'll know it's really you. And God does that for him, and he knows it's really him, and then Gideon has the wonderful thing where he gets, he gathers all of the people to go and fight, you know, against the uh, Midianites, and God says, that's too many people. You don't need that many. I, I want you to know that it wasn't because of the strength of your arms, but rather that I did it for you. And so, take them down to the river and have everybody get a drink, and anybody who laps water like a dog, versus the people who, you know, sip it like this, have the, you know, Send, send the ones, I don't remember which it is, the ones that lap like a dog get sent home, or the, you know, the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the lap like a dog, exactly. Yeah. Um, then you send them home, you know, send them back. And so, and he gets it down to a very small force, and then Gideon basically gives everybody a trumpet and a torch, 
and that's hidden, and they go out at night and spread out. And he says, when you hear me blow my horn, you blow your horn and scream like crazy and wave your torch. And God sends panic into the Midianites, and they start killing each other. And they run for it, and so they chase them down, and they're killing Midianites all along the way, and they have people guarding the fords of the river. And they win a great victory, even though they did it with just a few hundred people against a large army. Okay, So, that's the story of Gideon. And Gideon and Deborah are the two that provide good examples. Right? Again, he was named Jer uh, um, Jerubal because he defeated the forces of Baal. Then his son Abimelech comes along, and we told you that. Abimelech being an example that after Gideon, one of the best of the judges, after his, Gideon's death, Abimelech comes along as his son and tries to take over the country, killing his 70 half-brothers on one stone, it says. He killed them all in the same place. As an example of the fact that when, when the judge died, there's no leadership at all. Things just go, go you know, nuts. And Abimelech is an example of that. We then have a series of Tola and Jair, which we have very little detail about as minor judges, but they were raised up for their areas. Then Jephthah defeats the forces of Ammon and, and Moab. They had been oppressed for 18 years when Jephthah comes along in that area. And uh, he defeated the enemy, and then they had peace for six years. Then we have three more minor judges, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. Um, then we have, of course, the famous story of Samson. We, there's more about Samson than anybody else. There's four chapters about Samson. Uh, I think Gideon uh, has got three chapters about him. What, everybody knows the story of Sam, Samson, you know, getting his hair cut by Delilah and the whole thing. Uh, but again, Samson was not a very honorable guy. Uh, but still, he was a great warrior of God, and when he was obedient, and at the very end, he ends up asking God one last time to give him strength. He pushes apart the pillars of the Temple of Dagon, the roof falls in, and more, it says that there were more Philistines killed at that point at his death than he had killed during his whole military career. Um, so, he went out with a bang, quite literally. <laughs> Interestingly, I've seen photographs that they have unearthed in that area, uh, the ruins of temples of Dagon, and truly enough, on the altar end of it, there are pillars, you know, they only have the stumps of them now, but the pillars are only about six feet apart, you know. And a large, you know, close enough, that, or five or six feet apart, close enough that a large man literally could stand and put his hands on both those pillars. So we actually have a piece of archaeological evidence that, that that does appear consistent with the story of Samson being able to touch both of these pillars and push them apart as God gave him strength in order to collapse the Temple of Dagon on the Philistine leaders, okay? Um, so this story of the 12 judges and the continued failing of the people of Israel. As soon as the judge died, they fall right, fall right back into the way they were acting before. Then we get to the horrendous epilogue. Horrendous in, in the sense of what it tells us about the Israelites at that point. There are two sections, again, two episodes, which match the, the very brief two episodes that are part of the prologue. The first episode is the story of Micah's corruption of the religion. This is not the prophet Micah. This has nothing to do with the book, uh, the minor prophet Micah in the Bible. This is a completely different character, okay? In every way imaginable, a different character. Um, he decides, I told you, he stole from his mother. He decided, I don't know because she caught him or what. He gives the money back. She says she's going to give it all to God, and she doesn't. She has a silver idol made, supposedly in, in worship to God, even though God has clearly said, don't make any idols, no graven images. Micah sets it up in his own house along with other household gods. Again, not in obedience to God. Then this Levite comes along, just traveling through, with, um, and Micah says, Hey, I'll pay you a good wage, give you suits of clothes, and take care of you if you'll be my own private priest, my own Levite, my very own captive Levite, right here. And the Levite says, sounds like a pretty good deal. So he does it. The Levites were supposed to serve in the temple. What he was doing out there in the first place, we don't know. But the fact that he would agree to do this for monetary gain, again, was a sign that the priestly Levites were completely off the beam in terms of what their responsibilities were and how they were acting. Well, they're there. Um, with the Levites serving, and then the Danites come along. Now, 
I'm going to have to rip back here for a second because I want to show you. Okay. This green area right here is the area that was allotted to Dan. Now, the belief was that God had divided this land, that it was God's decision who would get what land, and that it was to be held by that people forever. You couldn't sell your property if you were one of the heirs to this, because like if you were a member of the tribe of Dan and you were given an allotment and said this is your land, you couldn't sell it to somebody from the tribe of Ephraim or anywhere else. Um, and in fact, that's why the whole, there was a whole system put in place that every six years you would have the sabbatical year and all property had to revert to the family that owned it. So you never did anything more than lease land to people. That property was considered a divine allotment given to you and your tribe by God. But the Danites, see who's right next to him here? This is Dan. Who's that? The Philistines, the same guys that Samson was having trouble with. And there are others. There are other groups of people in the hill country along here that the Danites were struggling with. So they said, to heck with this. We don't want to have to fight anybody that can fight back. <laughs> so they traveled all the way up here to a city that was called Laish. Somebody's got music going on. Whose phone is that? Might be important. <laughs> Wake up, Becky. That's all right. This city up here, north of the Sea of Galilee, all the way up here next to the Hittites and Arameans, it was a town called Laish that was settled by people from Sidon. They were uh, the Sidonians. They were a completely peaceful town. They didn't have any military presence. They didn't have any army. The Danites, this is just over 100 miles, they trek up here, you'll notice, just to the outside of where everybody else is living, and they attack the city of Laish, these people who are unarmed, and kill them all and take their city, thinking uh, they've had a peaceful time, so maybe we'll have a peaceful time if we kill them and take their city away from them. So along the way, they pass by, oh, I gotta mark these buttons up and down or something. <laughs> um, along the way, they pass by the home of Micah. And they hear the Levites speaking and they recognize the accent because these different peoples had different accents. And they go, You're a Levite? And he goes, well, Yeah. And he goes, well, What are you doing here? He goes, Well, I'm working for him. I'm his priest. Micah's. And they say, well, wouldn't you rather be the priest to a whole people? Because they're getting ready to head all the way up north, a long, long way away from Shiloh, which is where the tabernacle is. The temple hasn't been built yet. That comes later. And they go, well, we need a priest. You know, why don't you be a priest for our whole tribe instead of just a priest for this one job? <coughs> and he goes, okay. So they take the household idol, idols, and the idol that was built out of silver to God, and other stuff, <coughs> they rob Micah, and they take off. Well, Micah sees he's been robbed and his, his own private priest is gone, and he starts out after him. And they turn around and go, you really want to do this? You know? See this army? You know? I think you better go home. And he went, well, okay, but you guys are mean. And he goes home. So in this first episode, you've got corruption of the religious practices, an idol built, people stealing, people lying, a Levite who has forsaken his call, the Danites who do not are not obedient to God, and in fact are not willing to stay where they were told, where they were given land, who kill the people in an unarmed city, and then steal all of Micah's stuff and his priest, and march up every imaginable aberration of the religious, uh, of God's direction to them, of the law, of everything else is reflected in that first episode. Okay? And just horrendous example of how bad these guys have gotten. Then we have the second episode, which is worse. <laughs> we have um, a Levite is traveling with his concubine. Levites were not allowed to have concubines. That means if he has a concubine, that means he's got a wife somewhere. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to have a concubine. He apparently isn't very nice to her, and she runs off. And he says, fine, go. Well, after four months, he decides he's missing her. 
So he goes looking for her, ends up, she's gone home to her dad. He comes to the home of her parents, and for four days, and it's kind of hard to read this to understand what's going on, but they keep saying every morning he get up and go, I need to, you know, I need to go. We need to go. And her father said, no, stick around, have a drink. I mean, you know, relax, you got time. Basically, they had a party for four days. You know, three day parties twice a week kind of thing. <laughs> they had, and they're drinking and, you know, unable to do anything. And finally he says, okay, you know, this is, well, they end up traveling. They come to a town. They're in this, they get to a town late at night. They don't stop at Jerusalem because Jerusalem's not controlled by Israelites. It's controlled by Jebusites. So they bypass Jerusalem and come to the town of Gibeah where it is controlled by Israelites, but they get there so late they don't have any place to stay, and they're hanging out in the center of the town. And an old man comes in, and he goes, you don't have any place to stay? Well, you, well, come stay with me. So he gives them hospitality. They come into his house, and then we have a scene that echoes an event with a lot in Sodom, where a group of homosexual, a homosexual gang of thugs come banging on the door saying, send out that man that's visiting you so that we can have our way with him. And the old man who lives there says, no, uh, I have a daughter. He has a concubine. You can have them instead. Same thing that happens in the story of Lot, which is does not reflect well on anybody. <laughs> Finally, the Levite throws the concubine out the door, and they, this gang rapes her, to the point that the next morning when the guy opens the door and starts out, she's laying there, apparently dead. She doesn't say that right then, but apparently it is, because um, he says, get up, get up, and she can't get up, so he loads her on a, on a mule, on a donkey, whatever he's got. And they head off home. When he gets home, he takes the knife and cuts her in 12 pieces. That doesn't say he killed her, apparently she's dead. But he cuts her in 12 pieces and sends it to all 12 of the tribes of Israel. <laughs> So the 12 tribes of Israel send representatives, and they all get up in arms, and they're, all, they're thinking how horrific this is. They come, the Gibeah is in Benjamin, in the area of Benjamin, controlled by Benjamin. And they come to the people of Benjamin and say, turn the men who did this over to us that we can punish them. Benjamin says, no. And Benjamin calls all of their men together to form an army. They're going to fight the other Israelites, rather than turn over this gang that has raped this woman to death. So they go to war, and at first the Benjamites are getting the better of it. In fact, it ends up being over 65,000 people die in this war, counting both sides. And finally, they get the idea, the Gibeonites, uh, the, uh, the Israelites get the idea that they're going to trick them, and they lure them out th on the third day, thinking that they're going to, they think they're going to be just like they did the first two days. And they sneak into the city behind them, set the city on fire, and then de defeat the armies. The 600 of them run off. 600 of the Benjamites. That's all that's left of the tribe of Benjamin. 600 men. Everybody else is killed. Then, <laughs> the Israelites say, this is terrible. The Benjamites are pretty much gone. <laughs> One of the 12 tribes of Israel has been completely destroyed. And, you know, there ought to be 12 tribes, so what, what can we do now? Because we've sworn an oath that of those 600 Benjamites that ran, we're gonna, not going to kill them, but we've sworn that we won't let our daughters be married to any of them, and they don't have any women left, so how are they going to reproduce? The tribe of Benjamin's going to just be, you know, it's going to die out. And they go, well, okay. They attacked the town, killed all the men, and got 400 women who were virgins, killed all the married women, took 400 virgins, and gave them to the Benjamites. <laughs> as though that, were gonna, that was going to help. Again, this is evil on top of evil on top of evil on top of evil. No moral compass at all. Well, and then they said, um, yeah, but that's not enough. That's only 400, and there's 600 men. They're 200 short. What are we going to do? And they said, okay, well, the next festival at Shiloh, worship. A bunch of, it was typical for young women to come and to worship the Lord by dancing. Tell the Benjamites that we will look the other way, and they can hide in the bushes, and when these young girls come out, if they can catch them, they can have them. It's horrible! Everything about it is absolutely horrible. There is nothing good done by anybody in this whole thing. 
in these last two episodes. But again, the reason is because, you know, we have the isolated cases of the judges earlier on. These two stories give us the picture that virtually everybody in Israel had completely lost their way, morally, religiously. There was no ethics of any kind. They thought nothing of, you know, having concubines when they should have had wives, even though they were supposed to be religious people, the Levites, of letting their concubines be killed and then cutting them up into pieces, of, of you know, uh, destroying unarmed towns, take, stealing their, the virgin women and giving them to people who you just killed all of their women, and now you're feeling kind of bad about it, so let's, let's kill a bunch of other people to make it up for them, and on and on. And you're going, ah. This is why this is the time of moral crisis. This is perhaps the lowest time in the history of the Israelites, is this period of the Judges. Okay? Now, during this same period, we get the story of Naomi and Ruth in the book of Ruth. So I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes, take a break, <laughs> cry a little if you need to, after all that. Things I didn't mention about Judges, and let me uh, say this. As you read through Judges, you may have noticed that uh, a number of times it will say, and everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. Okay, that's, that's a refrain that's repeated several times. And what was right in their eyes clearly wasn't what was right in God's eyes. Another thing that's mentioned several times is um, there was no king in Israel. That, two, two facts in there, that statement and one fact, tell us about when this book apparently was written, or at least when the final version of it was written, because there may have been other people, again, we believe, anointed by God to, you know, to collect these stories, etc. Whether Samuel started it, or finished it, or whatever. The, the fact that the city of Jerusalem is still controlled by the Jebusites, means it was before David. Because David, one of the fairly early things he did when he became king was conquer uh, the Jebusite city of Jerusalem and make it his capital. So we know that it was before David was, you know, at the very latest, at the very start of his, his reign. But we know that it was during the time when it, there was a king, at least Saul, maybe Saul or very early in David's time, because it wouldn't make any sense for somebody to say there was no king in Israel. Israel had never had a king. The only reason they would have a comment like that was if the person who wrote it had an experience of there being a king in Israel who provided some direction and guidance and leadership. Make sense? You wouldn't have a comment that keeps being, in fact, that's the last, the last verse in the book of Judges is, and there, there, at this point there was no king in, in Israel. Nobody would have said that unless they had an experience of a king in Israel, and Saul, who was after the Judges period, was the first king. So we know that it was during the period of Saul, or at the latest, very early time of David, because they had the experience of a king and knew what a stabilizing influence it could be, but they had not yet conquered the city of Jerusalem. Okay? Marvin. I always understood that they saw the nations around them who had kings, and they were mm -hmm. jealous that they, they have kings to guide them. We don't have a king. Well, that's the reason that they called for a king. Yeah. But to say there was no king in Israel, again, the fact that that keeps being repeated almost as though that's an explanation for why these people were so messed up back then. But, but Saul, once a king came along, he gave them some direction. Did so, Saul at some time in his in reign as king lose the power to be king? Well, he, he did, but he still was a king. I mean, he still was an influence. Yeah. Um, Saul united the kingdom. In fact, we'll, when we get to next week, we will look at the kingdom that Saul was responsible for uniting, and then David, and then Solomon. Okay, each of the three kings over the united monarchy were responsible for expanding it. But again, the reference, it was the Israelites themselves who said, you know, we want a king like everybody else. Yeah, I remember the prophet was pretty unha unhappy about that. When yeah. God said they want a king. It's Samuel, said, yeah. I'm the king. <laughs> Samuel said, wait a minute, I, you know. And God said, it's not, you shouldn't be offended. It's not you they're having a problem with. They're not wanting me to be in charge. So, but the indication is that it was either, it was sometime during Saul or very early in David's reign when the book of Judges was at least finally collected. Yes? Who was the last judge? The last judge was Samuel, actually, and Samuel is not referring to before, before Samuel. The, uh, Samson. Uh, so, in, in fact, another interesting point I didn't say, Samuel is considered the, the last of the judges and the first 
of the major prophets. And it was Samuel that God used to select both Saul and David as kings. So Samuel is a major player, okay, very important. But one of the reasons traditionally why it's believed that Samuel was probably one that collected this is one, he's in the right time period. You know, he was he was prophet during the time of Saul and um, in the time of David. And so he's in the right time period, plus the fact that he does not include himself in the story of the judges is very indicative. People back then, I mean, you, you get the same thing all the way to the New Testament, where John, in the Gospel of John, never refers to himself by name. Whenever you read John in John's Gospel, he's talking about John the Baptist, not John the Evangelist. Okay, uh, And it was quite common. Paul was very different in that regard. <laughs> you know, Paul made clear it was him. But it was quite common in the in, in Hebrew writing to not identify yourself, because the idea was anything that was written to be read was the property of the community, not of the person who wrote it. And so you didn't label it as being yours. And so it's thought that Samuel, as an act of modesty and consistent with the culture, ended the book of Judges, the last judge at least, is referred to as Samson, when in fact Samuel was the last judge. And that's one of the indications he may have been the one who wrote it. Okay? Now during this same time period, as all this horrible was going on, that's reflected and recorded in the book of Judges. We have this masterpiece of a story, four chapters long, the book of Ruth. Okay. Um, again, the author is unknown, traditionally believed to be Samuel. Again, right time period and everything. So we believe the date was around 1010 BC, which is right at the start, right about the start of David's reign. So same time period. Now, the indication in this story is that this doesn't happen at the end of Judges but probably happened sometime earlier, somewhere in the middle of the period that the book of Judges talks about, the events of Ruth. One of the things that's indicated here is that it was a time period, and perhaps you know, it, was, it was after the defeat of the Moabites, and they had 80 years of peace from the Moabites. It may have been during that period because Ruth, for whom this book is named, is a woman of Moab. She's a Moabitess, and they keep calling her that all the way through the book. The fact that they're able to travel back and forth between Moab and Israel, and that the, the Israelites' sons married women from Moab indicates it was one of the times during the period of the Judges in which there was peace between Moab and Israel. Um, and so we have an indication of that. Uh, the theme is the story of a faithful foreigner, the purpose to show the kind of faithfulness, godliness, loyalty, and love that God desires for us. And there are four chapters. And I'm going to get. I'm going to give you an outline again. The four, and it's like a four, you know, four act play is the way it's presented. There is the presentation of the problem: Naomi and Ruth suffering from poverty and with nobody to support them. Then they travel back to uh, their homeland in uh, Bethlehem, back to uh, to Israel from Moab, which is east of the Jordan River. Um, then she meets Boaz, who's a relative by marriage of hers. They. Uh, they get together, the threshing floor, and then there eventually is a marriage and a healing of everything. And I'll get into more detail of that when, when we look at the longer outline. But it is, the four major parts are broken up like four acts of a play in this four chapter uh, story. Now, as I said earlier, the book of Ruth is not considered either a historical book um, by the Jewish, in the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, nor is it considered a prophetic book like Judges is. Um, Judges is con Joshua and Judges are considered books of prophecy in the Hebrew Bible. Ruth is considered part of the wisdom literature, the Ketuvim, um, along with uh, a, well, quite a few books, Psalms, Proverbs, um, Job, and others. But more specifically, Ruth is one of the five megalot, or the five scrolls of the Jewish uh, Bible, the Tanakh. There are five books which are each one is read every year at a different major festival in the Jewish year. The, the book, the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon as we call it, um, is always read on the, the Sabbath day of Passover week. So in, some, the, in some of the Eastern Ashkenazi, they read it every Sabbath. They will read it out loud. When I say read it, to read it publicly. So the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, is read every year at the Sabbath, the, the Sabbath Saturday of Passover week. The Book of Lamentations, written by Jeremiah, and remember Lamentations is called Lamentations because it's a lament, a mourning 
for the destruction of Jerusalem. Lamentations is read on the ninth of Av every year, publicly read, which is the celebration, not celebration, the acknowledgement or recognition of the destruction of both of the temples. The first temple, you know, which was, was uh, dis destroyed by the Babylonians. The second temple, which was destroyed by the Romans. They, they consecrate that day and read the book of Lamentations in acknowledgement of the destruction of both of the temples of Jerusalem. The book of, so, Song of Songs, Lamentations, the third of the scrolls, or Megalot, as they're called, which is read on a, a special event, special festival, is the book of Ecclesiastes, which is read at Sukkot, which is the, the Feast of Tabernacles, in recognition of the desert experience. The Feast of Tabernacles, they literally build these little sukkot, which they're called, which are like little sheds with palm roofs, in, in recognition and remembrance of having lived in the desert for 40 years. And they will, the Jewish, observant Jewish families will eat their meals there. Some of them will even sleep in there during the week of the festival of Sukkot. And so this, and those are called Sukkot, which means tabernacles or, or coverings. Um, so that's the book of Ecclesiastes. And then, most famously, the book of Esther is read publicly every year at the festival of Purim, which is the story of the book of Esther where Haman, the evil guy, once has a plan to destroy all the Jewish people and ends up being saved because of Esther, who was the queen of Persia at that time. And the fifth one, so that's Song of Songs, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. The fifth one is the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is read every year at uh, Shavuot, which is the, the festival of weeks, which is the celebration of the giving of the Torah, of the law. And it is the story of... Um, and it, they do that because it's the story of a uh, foreign woman, a non-Israelite, who comes to follow the law, to believe in Israel, to be so committed to her family that she married into, that she ends up being the ancestor of King David. Okay, um, Ruth's son, Obed, was the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David. Yes? Was she allowed to become an Israelite? Is she allowed to become Jewish? Um, yes. Anybody can become Jewish. So um, in this back then, she could as well? Yes. Yeah. Um, and again, that's the whole purpose of this. Some people have proposed that this may have been actually written at a time when they had had peace with Moab, but they were beginning to have people who had prejudice again. And so this story is written in order to show that here is a Moabitess, a woman from Moab, who is a better Jew than the Jews, in effect. And not only is she committed to her Israelite family and to the law and to living in Israel in Bethlehem, but she also is just a, a, model, a model in terms of her loyalty to her mother-in-law. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about, let's go through that uh, detail. I, uh, one other thing I have to tell you, because I think it's kind of fun. These, these five scrolls, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther, written in, which are read at the festivals, are called the Megillot. One, each one is called a Megillah. And some of you have heard me say this before. Have you ever heard the expression, the whole Megillah? <laughs> Never heard that expression? On Shalada, okay. yes. What's that? On Shalada, yes, but not Megillah. Okay, the whole Megillah. Um, the reason for that is because when they read these scrolls, some of them, like Esther's pretty long. It can take a long time to read the, read the whole scroll of Esther. And so, you know, these kids are sitting around listening to this long thing, going, oh man, he's going to read the whole Megillah. <laughs> So, that's where that expression comes from. Okay. Um, anyway, I think that's kind of fun. Um, all right. Uh, key verses, I believe. Ruth 1, 16 and 17. Um, and I'll tell you the story behind this in a second. Naomi tells Ruth, her two daughters, Ruth and Orpah, and by the way, Oprah Winfrey, her name is a misspelling of the name Orpah. Her mother wanted to name her Orpah, and they wrote it down wrong, and so it became Oprah. So Oprah Winfrey is named for the other daughter-in-law in this story. But when Naomi tells Orpah and Ruth, since Naomi's husband, Elimelech, oh, let me tell you the background in case you haven't read it, I'm sure you will have. Elimelech is a Jewish man. He has a wife, Naomi. They have famine where they live in the region around Bethlehem, and so they travel to Moab, where they think that they'll, it'll be a better situation for them. You know, they'll, they'll have work, etc. Um, they have two sons, both of whom are sickly. Elimelech dies, 
leaving Naomi a widow. And then uh, the two sons marry Moabite women, uh, Ruth and Orpah. Then the two sons die. So Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah are left with no males. They're in a land where, you know, uh, Naomi at least is not from. No way to care for themselves. Back then they didn't have welfare. If a woman didn't have somebody to take care of her, she either starved to death or she became a prostitute or she remarried. Naomi's too old to remarry, too old to have more children, too old probably to be a prostitute. And so she is ready to just die. She's ready to give up. And she tells her two daughter-in-laws, why should you suffer with me? Go back to your homes, to your Moabite families, find new husbands, be happy. Orpah says, well, I hate to do it, but okay. She leaves. <laughs> Ruth says, I'm not leaving you. I love you. You're my family now. And in fact, we have this passage. Ruth replied to Naomi, telling her to go. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. The really ironic part is that quite often people will read this at their weddings. This is between a woman and her mother-in-law, okay? not between a married couple. And yet people will read this as part of their vows or part of their commitment to each other, which is fine. I mean, it's just still a good sentiment. Um, but that's the story. That's what's going on. And here is the outline, the book of Ruth. First, there is the introduction, what they call Naomi empty, which means her husband's died, her two sons who are newly married die, she's got nothing. And she decides, if I'm going to die, I want to go back to my homeland, back to Israel, back to Bethlehem, and I'll die there. And at one point when she gets back to the area around Bethlehem, she says, Naomi means pleasantness. And she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, pleasantness, call me Mara, which means bitter. All right? So she's broken. That's why they say Naomi emptied, everything is gone. So she returns from Moab, Ruth swears this pledge we just read that she's going to stay with her. So Ruth and Naomi return to Bethlehem. When they get to Bethlehem, um, one of the things the Old Testament called for is that when somebody had a field of grain, when they harvested it, they would be careful not to collect everything. They should leave stuff behind so that poor people can go through and collect up enough to live on. Okay? And so it, this is called gleaning. And in this case, because Naomi's older, Ruth says, I will go out and glean the fields in order to get grain so that we'll have something to eat, because they have no money. So Ruth goes out to the fields, and she starts gleaning the fields, and it turns out a man named Boaz. Now, Ruth is a young woman. Boaz, apparently, is a middle-aged man, but a man of some means. He owns these fields, he hires these workers. He goes out to the fields, and there's this young woman who is gleaning the fields. And he asks about her, and obviously she's working very hard. He asks his workers about her, and they say, well, she's the Moabite woman who refused to leave Naomi. She's really been, you know, everybody's talking about how she's been so committed to her mother-in-law. She wouldn't go back to her own home. She's taking care of Naomi now. And so Boaz says to his workers, you make sure nobody bothers her. Don't let anybody bother her. And make sure you leave extra shocks of grain behind so that she'll have plenty. Okay? So he shows kindness. Ruth, at the end of the day, is done really, really well with her gleaning. She goes back to Naomi, and Naomi says, where did you get all that grain and stuff? And she says, well, I went out to the field, and this guy, apparently his name is Boaz. And Naomi goes, Boaz is a relative of ours. Okay? And so Naomi says, there may be something that we can work out here. Okay, she becomes... A Jewish matchmaker. <laughs> and so Naomi gives instructions to Ruth. Go back to the threshing floor. And when they're there, um, when Boaz sits down to rest, then approach him and flirt with him. Present yourself to him. It's not clear whether Naomi is suggesting something that might be untowards or not. But at any rate, 
Ruth follows her instructions. She goes to, to, um, to Boaz, and it says that she uncovered his feet. Well, one of the reasons we're not sure about this is because in the Old Testament, feet is a euphemism for genitals. We don't know if that's what's going on here. But whatever, whatever is in Naomi's mind, and Ruth is being obedient to Naomi, Boaz acts honorably. Okay, he does not take advantage of the situation. He, whether, whether or not that's what Ruth was proposing at, at Naomi's suggestion or not, we don't know. But nothing untowards happens. And in fact, when Naomi expresses her interest and affection for Boaz as a relative, and Boaz finds out that they're relatives, they had a principle in those days called the kinsman redeemer. Um, I mentioned earlier that if you were Jewish, you couldn't sell your property. If you did, then you, you, know, you had to get it back in six years. Well, one aspect of that whole principle of maintaining the promised land allotments to the people that they were given to is the principle of the kinsman redeemer. What that meant is if, if I was relative to somebody, and they fell on hard times and they had to sell some of their property to someone else in our tribe or whatever, that I had a moral obligation, if it were within my power, to buy that property back and give it back to my relative. The kinsman part means we're relatives. We're part of the same tribe. We have a, we have a blood link. The redeemer part means if it's within my power, I need to redeem their land, pay a price to get it back in order to give it back to my relatives. Okay? That's what the kids been redeemer. When Boaz realized that he is a relative of Ruth's, she's a young woman who has expressed interest in a relationship, he, being related to Naomi, um, says, I can make the claim as a kinsman redeemer. And it turns out that Naomi had owned a piece of property at one point, or her husband Elimelech had, and so Boaz says, let me see if I can claim this land for you and therefore give you an income. You know, you can start, you can plant a garden. You can have something to help take care of you, Ruth, and Naomi. Well, he finds out that there is another relative that's closer in, in relationship than he is. A, a closer kinsman redeemer. So he goes to the city gate and he um, confronts, we're down here to 5A, he confronts the unnamed kinsman redeemer, doesn't tell us who he is, and says... Naomi is here, and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and, you know, they had a historic right to this field. Um, will you redeem it for them? Oh, and by the way, that means you'll also get to marry Ruth. Well, the guy's interested until he says you also get to marry Ruth. Now, Boaz is a, is a little tricky here. He's not really being dishonest, but technically, the right would be to marry Naomi, who's old. He says you can marry Ruth. Well... If it had been an old woman who's not likely to have any children, because if she had children, then there would be other heirs, and he'd probably have trouble with his kids, and his wife might, you know, might not mind an old woman that's technically married to her husband, but a young woman, probably not a good idea. So, the kinsman redeemer says, I, I'd be happy to do it, but I can't marry Ruth. So, I, re I renounce my claim. So, Boaz is next in line. So, Boaz purchases the land, to give back to Naomi, and in the process, pledges his marriage to Ruth. The two of them, they claim the property, the two of them get married, middle-aged Boaz, young, attractive, very sweet, very kind, very committed, Ruth. And at the very end, see the interesting thing about this book too is, this is, um, it's not really the story of Ruth, it's the story of Naomi. It starts with Naomi and ends with Naomi because at the very end, Ruth has a child. Ruth and Boaz have a child. But Naomi takes the child and is holding it and taking care of it like every grandmother wants to do. But all of the women that know them say, Naomi now has a son. You know, as though she, she's been fulfilled. She lost two sons to illness and now she has a grandson like an heir. And then they reveal, and they named him Obed who became the father of Jesse, who became the father of David. This is King David. And therefore, the line carried on to Jesus, as is pointed out in the New Testament. So Ruth, a Moabitess, a foreigner, as well as Rahab, who also was a foreigner and an ex-prostitute, 
end up being showing up in the genealogy of Jesus. Because here are two women who acted righteously in favor of the people of God, and therefore God had them be part of the lineage that led eventually to Jesus. So, this wonderful story, you know, whereas the book of Judges has, there's nobody good in the book. I mean, the, 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 yeah, the judges themselves, but apart from that, we don't have any decent characters. And everybody else we get introduced to is just a slime bucket. I mean, they're horrible people. The story of Ruth, which happens in the same time period, I believe is probably given to us in order for us to see that down the ranks, at the ordinary people, there were still people who were following God, who were trying to be moral, who were trying to do the right thing. You know, that while you know the people as a whole had given themselves over to horrible things, there were people like Ruth, like Naomi, like Boaz, who still tried to serve God and be righteous. Marvin? Well, we have a timeline for Ruth then because of her, if Boaz was grandfather of David, he'd have to be at least Twenty, say before he had his child, David's father would be at least twenty. David was the seventh son or eighth son, was yep. so that he's got to be twenty-five, thirty. So he got sixty, seventy years at least before David became king. Exactly. So it could have been eleven hundred, even you know, uh, somewhere in the in the eleventh century, you know, in there. If David became king right after one thousand, yeah. then sometime in the century before that, long enough for there to be three generations, would have been the story. That's why we know that Ruth falls right in the period of Judges, okay? Because Judges really goes from the death from the death of Joshua to the time of Samuel, which, you know, uh, David would be born right about the time Samuel was anointing Saul, because he was a young man when Saul uh, finally got renounced Saul. Yes, Joanne? Well, I have to wonder if God didn't also put in Ruth because of the fact as an example that the Jewish people lorded over the rest of the world that he was Jew. Exactly. In his lineage, Argent is a Gentile. I think that's a good point. In fact, one of the things that, that the Jews tended to overlook in their own scripture, uh, and that we need to always be aware of, is that God repeatedly demonstrates. While the Jews were his chosen people, and he, he selected them, he worked through them, they were to be the, the means, the medium by which God would make his will known to the whole world. But all the way through the process of the Old Testament, we have example after example where God deals with and through and in non-Jewish peoples. Jonah was sent to the Ninevites, the Assyrians. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, came to believe in the one true God. Um, you have examples like this, Ruth and um, Rahab and others. Always, God demonstrates that all people are his people, ultimately. Now, not in the same way. The Jews are especially a select chosen people. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have anything to do with everybody else. He made them all. He still acts through all. And he still has concern for all of them. I mean, Jonah was sent to minister to the Ninevites for the sake of the Ninevites, not for the sake of Jonah. Okay. Um, and so God expresses a concern. And you're right. And as I say, some people have, have thought that this appeared at the time that it did, the story, in order... Partly to say, well, not everybody during the Judges was as bad as that. Most of them were, but not everybody. But also, in a time when people may have been, again, starting to say, you know, there's no such thing as a good Moabite. You know, they had ethnic prejudice, literally a kind of racial prejudice, against other peoples. And it may be this story was inserted there, that God, God ordained this story, that God, you know, called for the story to be presented in order to communicate the message that a righteous person who seeks after me, I don't care where they were born or what people they were born to, they are still one of my people if they if they choose to be. Okay. And so that was very powerful in that regard. Did you guys like the story? Oh, yeah. 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 It's a great one. Um, and um, I don't know that I have anything else to say about it. Any questions or comments about that? First, Joanna, and then you. Well, I, I love Ruth, and I wish I would have known that book much better when I was really young, because I had met a Jewish man, and he made me feel really bad. Oh. He said, I, I'm, I'm Jewish, I'm a chosen one, and he knew that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, now I want to make him again, so I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and again, it's, there are a lot of examples where God works through, blesses, is concerned for, ordains work through, 
uh, people who are not Jewish. Not to say less of the Jewish people, because they are unique and chosen. But to look down your nose, I think they're the reasons why we have Ruth and we have uh, Rahab and we have people like that. Yes? Uh, something about uh, the, the whole story is a love story. And uh, uh, a group of women, and I did a study on Ruth, and we all wanted to be Ruth. We all wanted to, you know, have the characteristics that Ruth had. Uh, because she showed such love and compassion. But Ruth, uh, not but, uh, but we believe that Ruth is probably quite attractive mm -hmm. because Boaz noticed her not only as kind, uh, but he would be attractive. He noticed her before he knew who she was. Exactly. So she, yeah. it was only, he asked his workers, who is that? Yes. So he had noticed her and they said, well, that's Ruth who just came back with Naomi that's taking care of her. And so he too had heard that she was what she was like, but yes. he saw her visually first. Yes. So, yeah. uh, and since men are visual, <laughs> you know, he <laughs> saw her and, and inquired of her. But also that Ruth, um, we believe, I believe, was attracted to Boaz um, because he, uh, he was a middle-aged man. Um, he was of means, but I think he was also probably very strong and he was attractive to he, her. Well, and he showed kindness. And he showed great kindness to her. So that, um, it's a beautiful love story. Yeah. It truly is. But again, for the all of the love story between Boaz and Ruth, it is even more a love story between Ruth and Naomi. Naomi. And it has to do yes. with, with, you know, it's a beautiful model of what commitment means. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I pledge to commitment and even though your son is dead, you are still, you know, my family. And I'm not leaving. Go to a strange country. Exactly. Yes. That's yes. 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 Um, yes. Ruth came from pagan. Uh, the Moabites were pagan. Yes. I mean, they would have worshipped one of the uh, the Baals would have been common. But whatever she came from in that regard, when she married into this Israelite family, she accepted God. Again, you remember, your God will be my God, and she's affirming this to Naomi. So that she had been, which was typical. I mean, if you if you married in, if a woman married into a family, she would accept the family and the religious beliefs and everything else that the husband had. But in this case, she had the opportunity to renounce that and go back to what she'd known before, but she didn't. She said, No, I've made a commitment to this and I'm sticking with it, which means I'm sticking with you, Naomi. You know, you're you're now my mother, uh, in effect. Lynn. I'm really being proud to be a woman and to um, read the chapter about Naomi because my husband died quite young and unexpectedly and when I took his body back to Canada to be buried his mother said to me I don't suppose I'll see you anymore mm -hmm. and it was like for me it was a huge I, I was I hit by a wave of mm -hmm. I don't know what fear unknown, just couldn't understand and accept. And she still finds it, like we have been very close together um, for many years because she didn't have a daughter, she only had sons. Right. And she and I are of the same height and build and coloring and uh, she is with me from Holland. So people would say to her, this is your daughter. And she'd say, well, it's my daughter, not it's Bob's wife. Yeah. And all of a sudden to be told, I don't expect to see you again. I said, I'm sorry, you're stuck with me. I didn't know what to say, but you're what? stuck with me. I said, you're still the same precious person for me that you've always right. been. But that's fairly typical. I mean, yeah. again. Oh, exactly. And that's one of the reasons that this jumps out so much yes. in us. Yes. Why yes. this is so striking is that she would make that level of professional commitment to her mother-in-law after her husband Naomi's son was dead, um, to the extent of being willing to go to a foreign country and to continue to take care of her. You know, so. Yes, but that Naomi um, allowed that to happen. Yeah. You know, um, well, she, it was a two-way thing. But she expected to send, you know, she tried to send her off. Yeah. I and mean, she really argued with her to try to get her to leave, and Orpah did. So, yes, Rich. You know, I don't think you could have written a story that had the intrigue and, and the way this thing all worked its way out. Right. And I see the sovereignty in God working in, in this whole story, right. with the father dying, or her husband dying, and then the two boys mm -hmm. die, and then they come over here, and yep. the family situation, it's just, 
Yeah, now most, most people believe, most scholars believe that this, is, this is, a, is not a true story. This is a fictional story. That doesn't diminish its impact. Okay, because the point is, God inspired Samuel or whoever wrote it with this story in order to communicate a point. But it's not, this is typically not believed to, you know, that Naomi and Ruth and Boaz were historical characters. But they represented a type that we needed to be aware of and that God therefore inspired people to write. Now maybe it was, but most people think that probably wasn't. Uh, but that, that does not lessen it. Thank you. What about Obed? Yeah, what about the genealogy? Well, the, um, yeah, Ruth, Ruth does appear in the genealogies. So, um, maybe the whole thing is true, or maybe there's, you know, that they created a story to support that. But again, don't misunderstand. I'm not diminishing this in terms of the importance of it as being part of Scripture. Yes? If I tell the story of how my parents met, it's going to be a little romanticized because yes. I wasn't there. Oh, yeah. and, and, and this was obviously written in the time of David, or at least. Right. And so it's a hundred-year-old story like like Marvin said, yeah. it changes, and, and it gets neater and neater over yeah, time. Exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah, and it's beautifully constructed. You're right, it, it had to be written, and see, David already had to be king, because saying they named their son Obed, and yeah. he was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, would not have made any sense unless David was somebody important. Yeah. The whole point of saying that is David has already become king. So, yes, and but in, in terms of the names that are here, you know, are real historic names, we believe. But in terms of the romanticized story, again, it, it may be that, 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 that God inspired, if it was Samuel who wrote it, with this story as a way of really communicating very, very important ethical values to us that he wants us to know about. Marvin? Well, Boaz, as the kinsman redeemer, not only did he redeem the field, which would go back to Naomi and her family, but bore a child with Ruth so that there would be an heir so that... Uh, and he's not concerned about his own wealth. It's not all mine. It's mine. Exactly. It's not. He's, he's willing to partner with, right, in the spirit of the kids of the redeemer. Yep. And and you know, while Boaz is sort of the key that makes this whole thing work, there's very little emphasis on Boaz in terms of you don't hear a lot about Boaz later. You know, once he's once he's done the act of of um, gaining the right to be the kinsman of the redeemer and marrying uh, marrying Ruth, you know, it's not like we have. Further tales of the adventures of Boaz, you know, the really cool guy. But he served a very critical purpose there, and he was an honorable man in, uh, in several ways. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time off early today. Um, we will pick up next week as we get into um, Samuel and start talking about the united monarchy. When we get into Saul and then David and later Solomon.